Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa. I'm the editor of Orinoco Tribune, orinocotribune.com. Um, today I wanna talk to you, give you my insights, my opinion, my take on several events, incidents that happened or were part of the Venezuelan debate uh, last month, in the month of April. Today is May 3rd, Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. And basically what I want to do is to talk to you about three important issues. First, about the at what stage is the Venezuelan opposition right now in front of the, the primaries that they have scheduled for October this year, but also uh, amid the... 2024 presidential elections here in Venezuela. I also want to talk about the uh, Petros International Conference on Venezuela and how we see it uh, from, you know, the Orinoco Tribune perspective. Uh, and also uh, what I call Guaido's final act, which distracted, uh, you know, some of the attention to the International Conference on Venezuela uh, that happened uh, last week. Uh, and uh, and that's going to be it. I want to try to make it in, in 30 minutes. And uh, before that, as usual, I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to our social media accounts. Uh, and I also need to invite you to, to support us via donations using Patreon or PayPal. Uh, those tools are, uh, you know, uh, you can find how to do it in our website, but also volunteering to Orinoco Tribune that will help us a lot also. So if you cannot uh, uh, support us financially, something that we uh, need a lot, uh, uh, the, the support via volunteering is also pretty important and will make our work better and uh, better and and, and 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 more accurate so this is it i mean uh, i i will start with the with the opposition uh, situation something that i call the opposition loss in its labyrinth um its primaries and 2024 presidential elections and there, uh, the most important thing uh, is uh, is that the the the, the candidates that you found uh, in the in the for these primaries, opposition primaries that are scheduled for October uh, this year. Uh, so you have uh, they talk here a lot. I'm talking when they say today, I'm talking about the opposition people. Uh, they talk about newcomers and the importance of having a, uh, a newcomer. But the reality is that there is no newcomer uh, in uh, any of the of the three candidates that are there. The most relevant, the most relevant ones are Maria Corina Machado, uh, Benjamin Russo, which is a comedian that we uh, locally know as El Conde del Guacharo. Uh, we have Enrique Capriles, um, and we have like, I believe that like like, like fifteen more uh, candidates uh, or, or or eighteen more candidates uh, among the opposition, uh, you know, wanting to become the presidential candidate for twenty twenty four. Uh, so that that debate, I mean that that debate about newcomer uh, is. A joke. There, there are no newcomers. Some people say that Maria Corina Machado is a newcomer. The reality is that she is from the old guard, far right, extremist Venezuelan opposition. Uh, she always has been there. She is not a newcomer. The same thing with El Conde del Guacharo when, when Benjamin Rousseau. Uh, he was actually also a presidential candidate. Uh, uh, a few years ago, and and, and he didn't get uh, too much traction. Uh, uh, and basically, what we have is the same old leadership that is responsible uh, for what is has been happening 
to the Venezuelan opposition, but also to the country. So um, I believe that is important to to highlight that that there are no newcomers and 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 that we just have the same old traditional uh, opposition leadership uh, that do not understand uh, the needs of the Venezuelan people that only think most of them about what uh, be uh, liked in Washington. So I don't see any, I, I mean, trying to think as a right winger, as an opposition based person, I don't think that uh, any of those candidates there are, you know, bringing traction or a lot of interest among anti chavistas. So I wanted to let you know the, uh, that, that, I mean, at least that's what I see from my corner where, where, where I see how I see things here in Venezuela. Then we have them also divided about, or at least they try to portray themselves as divided uh, in relation to sanctions, to the illegal sanctions from the US and the European Union mostly. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and there's an interesting, uh, development in which you find uh, some voices among uh, anti-chavismo uh, calling for the listing of sanctions, recognizing that sanctions are not good. I don't think that they care too much about how bad they are for the people, but I believe that they care much more about how sanctions make them look like, if you understand what I mean. So, so, so I believe that they have been realizing that they don't look very good as sponsor, sponsors of sanctions. So there is a this trend. I believe that is not the most important one, but there's this trend amongst anti-chavismo calling for the lifting of sanctions, and that's an interesting development. I'm not sure if it is just a pre-electoral, you know, uh, strategy, but anyway, it's something that is there. And even as a strategy, is a is an evidence of the of the bad consequences that U.S. sanctions had, even uh, on the anti-chavista, the opposition, uh, far right uh, sector in Venezuela. So that's another development that that I wanted to highlight in relation to how the opposition. I see the opposition right now. The other important thing is that uh, uh, if they are going to use the, the National Electoral Council, the CNE, as the tool uh, for the primaries, and uh, in that respect, it looks like the uh, that the, it looks uh, that. I mean, I believe that what is going to happen is that they are going to opt for doing the primaries without the CNA, the, the CNA, the National Electoral Council. And, and that's gonna be a disaster for them because it's gonna be the repetition, rep, repetition of previous primaries where uh, the absence of the CNE uh, uh, make them lose a lot of credibility uh, in the results of the elections. So that's going to be, uh, I mean, reading uh, on the opposition debate, what they say, what they write in recent weeks, I have the impression that they will opt for doing the, the primaries without the help of the CNE. The technical assistant is the, is the term that is in our legal framework. And talking about legal framework, it's important to say that the CNE is not mandated to organize all the primaries of all the parties. It's not in, in the law. It's, it's not in in their scope in their in their fun functions. I mean, the CNE the CNE can be of technical assistance to political parties, any political party, if it is requested by that political party or that group of political parties. So legally talking, it's perfectly possible 
the uh, for the opposition for the unitary platform to organize the primaries without the CNE. The the the, the issue, of course, is going to be related to how credible uh, the results are going to be. So that's what I mentioned before. So that's basically what I wanted to say about the the opposition and how I see, you know, recent developments. Um, on on that side, uh, and, and and of course, uh, uh, today you know, for the last two or three days since Monday, uh, we have been having this debate in Venezuela because uh, the White House issue a new via OFAC issue a new uh, uh, I don't remember the, the name, but uh, the, it's not decree is. Anyway, a new decision, so the number 42, uh, basically uh, giving the ownership of Citgo, which is a company that belongs to the Venezuelan state, giving the ownership of Citgo to uh, the unitary platform or what they call the National Assembly of 2015 that Washington recognized as the legitimate government of Venezuela, which is... You know, uh, but I mean, it's like the the attempt to keep alive the crazy Guaido interim government campaign or project that everyone knows that failed. But they are trying to do it, and they did something terrible uh, uh, a few days ago, giving basically the right to this group to negotiate. Uh, the payment of uh, debts and claims by foreign firms and corporations against PDVSA, Venezuela. And for that, they basically what they are planning to do is they are trying to uh, liquidate Citgo uh, 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 in order to pay those debts. So it's something that has been there for several years already. It has been part of the discussion, but uh, this recent decision basically uh, moved uh, formally, more officially into that direction. So today and yesterday, there has been several statements from the Venezuelan government uh, um, denouncing and 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 in outrage for this crazy decision that violates Venezuelan constitutional framework, public international public law, uh, uh, free market law, everything. It violates everything. I mean, imagine that any country that have assets in the US today, uh, uh, I mean, they, they will realize those countries that is, it's a terrible risk to have assets in the U.S. because at any moment, if the U.S. Uh, dislike your government, they will be able uh, to do the same thing that they are doing against Venezuela, against Cisco. And and that's going to be uh, another clavo in el ataúd, as we say it in Spanish, of the uh, U.S. imperialism. Uh, so, so uh, that's basically uh, what I wanted to tell you about the, the opposition and how lost they are. But I want to talk now about the the Petros International, uh, Gustavo Petros, the Colombian president, International Conference on Venezuela. There has been a lot of debates about how good or bad the conference was. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start from the beginning, and and that is what was the goal of the conference. And since the beginning, President Petro said that the only goal of that conference was to serve as a catalizador. We say in Spanish as a as a promoter of resuming the the Mexico talks. That's basically what uh, 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 President Petro wanted with this conference, and uh, and 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 it's important to highlight that the Mexico talks were stalled or paralyzed uh, since January.
because or, or February when the Venezuelan government realized that the U.S. was not going to release $3.2 billion that were agreed in the framework of the Mexico talks to be released from illegal found seeds from Venezuela uh, by the U.S. government uh, uh, in order to finance social projects, health care projects, housing projects, emergency response projects. And, uh, and that agreement was not fulfilled by the, by the U.S. and the opposition. But you, we say the opposition here like a formality because the guy, the one, uh, the person running the show is the White House. So the White House did not want to release that money, maybe because they are using it uh, in another things, maybe rescuing, bailing out banks that are that are being, you know, bankrupted all over the U.S. But anyway, that's another debate. But uh, that's why the Mexico talks were paralyzed and remains paralyzed. And uh, and uh, and Petro's objective was to resume. You know uh, th that that um, those peace negotiations. In talking about those peace negotiations, it's important to highlight because some people don't understand why Venezuela have to uh, go to the Mexico talks. Some people will believe that it is because it's just uh, public relations seen uh, uh, by the Venezuelan government, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, to try to present himself itself like a, a government that talks with everyone. But in reality, uh, the Mexico talks are from one side uh, and a strategy by the U.S. to try to uh, push the Venezuelan government out and enforce the Venezuelan government to give uh, all kind of preference to the opposition, basically to... Uh, to commit uh, suicide. Uh, but from the Venezuelan side, the Mexico talks are a tool to try to lift illegal sanctions that are affecting us. And we and the government needs to try to do it. I mean, uh, 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 and that's why the Venezuelan government is, you know, in the Mexico talks mostly. Uh, and of course, the Venezuelan government during this la these last years uh, has been able to circumvent sanctions, but that has come at a very high cost. And the desirable scenario is not to have sanctions. So that's why the Venezuelan government is uh, decided to be part of the of the Mexico talks. So so that's basically the one of the most important objectives of the Venezuelan government participating in in those talks. And from the opposition side, of course, they want to have their um, free elections. That I don't know what that means. I mean, I believe uh, I I really believe that when the way when they talk about free elections, they are basically thinking that the government. And the Venezuelan the Chavismo is going to decide not to run for elections and let them win or something like that. Something that never is going to happen. But anyway, I mean, that's my impression of what they think when they talk about free elections. Uh, because we always have had free elections. The, uh, the oppositions have won uh, several elections, governorships, a major, uh, I mean, they, they have won uh, major elections. Uh, uh, they have won departamental elections in 2015. I mean, they constantly win elections, but of course they keep saying that the Venezuelan elections are not free. But anyway, that's another discussion, but I just wanted to, you know, give you a, a general idea of the goal of the, of the conference called by President Petro and the nature of the Mexico talks. Uh, the attendance, uh, I believe that the attendance for the, for the conference called by President Petro was important i mean uh there was this delegation uh, uh from the white house uh, with juan juan gonzalez uh and two other important uh you know advisors and and people connected directly to the white house that participated in the conference <laughs> sorry there was also the uh, the the Foreign Affairs Minister 
of Argentina, of Bolivia, the Prime Minister of St. Kings, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, mm, who else was there? Uh, the Foreign Minister of Chile, uh, the, the Joseph Borrell from the European Union, the the people from Norway that has been part of the, you know the the, the 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 mediation in the Mexico talks. So, I mean, they, and they were also representative from like fifteen more other countries. Uh, so the, the 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 conference has a, a very good attendance, and and if you compare it with what we had like two or three years ago with the Lima Group, that's a big shift in the in the in the correlation of forces in the regional approach towards Venezuela. You know, from the Lima Group. To the International Conference of Venezuela, you can see a big change in the for uh, a big change in the correlation of forces in the approach towards Venezuela from uh, uh, an aggressive um, um, I don't know how to say it, but the, the Lima Group was uh, uh, promoted an aggressive. Uh, interventionist, uh, isolationist approach towards Venezuela in order to try to help the regime change operation led by the U.S. And it didn't succeed. And now uh, we have this where President Petro has been very clear about the importance of lifting the sanctions uh, in Venezuela, but also the importance of trying to uh, to follow or, or or agree in the requirements expressed by the opposition, which is understandable. He's trying to serve as a mediator in my impression, my personal impression as a Venezuelan, that maybe a year ago was not very, uh, but, but was very skeptic about uh, Gustavo Petro is that he did that in very good faith and I believe that it might it might end end up in in good results disregarding these last two days noise about what happened with Citigo. So um, when you read the final declaration of the International Conference uh, on Venezuela, and we had to read it because we covered the, the these events closely. Uh, uh, when you read it, uh, you notice. At least the most important thing that we notice is that they call for the for the unfreezing of those three point two billions that the Venezuelan government uh, was is denouncing that uh, were not released by the U.S. government. So in the in the final declaration of the uh, International Conference on Venezuela organized by President Petro, the second point refers to that, that they are going to push for the release of those uh, funds uh, in a fast track approach, in, a, in the fast possible way. And that somehow, at least in, in our reading, uh, means uh, that uh, they are trying to uh, do what any negotiator should do. I mean, if you go to a negotiating table and you agree something, and one of the parts do not comply with what with what was agreed, uh, I mean, uh, that negotiation is not going anywhere. That happens here in Venezuela, in the Mexico talks, and anywhere in the world. So, so that's the the minimum uh, first step that the U.S. should do in order for Venezuela to take the U.S. seriously. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, uh, our impression is that uh, uh, that final declaration, I I mean, did something important in that direction, in the direction of. Um, of uh, releasing or unfreezing $3.2 billion that are illegally seized uh, in the US, belonging to Venezuela. And, and of 
course, uh, in these recent debates for the last two days in Venezuela, uh, it has been released by, by President Maduro and, and yesterday by Jorge Rodriguez and today by Delcy Rodriguez that uh, because of the insights that they received from that conference in, in Bogotá, that there was like almost a big unanimous position of 17. They talk about 17 out of the 20 countries that participated in the conference in Bogotá uh, were in favor of lifting all the sanctions against Venezuela. So I believe that that um, Canada, the U.S., and maybe Chile were the three ones. <coughs> that were not in favor of that poll. Uh, maybe it was not Chile, maybe it was another country, but, you know, that's my, I'm guessing, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, now we know that there was this big approach towards, you know, uh, the illegality, the, the necessity of lifting all the sanctions against Venezuela. Uh, but everyone knows how the U.S. is. I mean, the arrogancy, the imperial arrogancy is something that is going to take that empire uh, down. And, and it's part of uh, nature of empires. Uh, but anyway, um, I just want to mention that. And if you check the final declaration of Bogotá with the uh, statements that came later afterwards uh, uh, from the opposition, and from the Venezuelan government, you realize that they, you know, disregarding each one trying to push towards uh, their goals, its goals, uh, you notice that uh, from the Venezuelan side, um, there was this uh, recognition of the fort by President Petro. Of course, uh, the Venezuelan government called for the lifting of all sanctions, but make a special parenthesis on the $3.2 billion uh, that were not received and were agreed within the Mexico talks. Uh, and from the opposition uh, declaration statement, uh, you can read that at the end of that statement, and we published that in Orinoco Tribune a few days ago last week when, when that happened. Uh, <clears throat> you can feel, you can read that, that they at the end of that statement, they basically um, recognize the necessity of comply with what's ag what was agreed within the Mexico talks. I'm talking about the, the releasing of the $3.2 billion. So uh, in that sense, uh, my, my opinion after reading uh, all those documents is that the conference in Bogota might serve as a uh, <clears throat> as a tool to try to 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 make or force the U.S. government to release that money, and maybe that will open the door for the resumption of the Mexico talks. Of course, the Venezuelan government also won the the lifting of all sanctions, the releasing of Alex Av, uh, a diplomat that is in jail in in in, in Florida. Um, so, so, but I believe that those are like uh, end goals. You know what I mean? I believe that the intermediate goal here is the releasing of those 3.2 millions, uh, a move that, in my opinion, might help the resumption of the Mexico talks. And that's going to be good for everyone. I mean, for the opposition. For the U.S., because no one will believe in the U.S. if if they, you know, keep playing that card of going to negotiations and not complying with anything that was agreed within uh, negotiations. So anyway, uh, that's basically uh, uh, my position about what happened uh, with Petros. Uh, Diosdado Cabello uh, had some make some statements like kind of 
uh, no, not seeing the results of the of the conference in Bogota as important, or at least that they were sabotaged. He, basically, what he says is that the conference was sabotaged by the U.S., which is pretty understandable. But I don't have the impression that the conference failed. I will I still believe that uh, Petro's initiative is still alive. And I really believe that Petro is going to push uh, towards uh, at least the resumption of the Mexico talks. And that's going to be fine. It's going to be fine because Venezuela is going to be able to keep pushing for not only for those $3.2 billion seized, uh, uh, on, I mean, frozen in the, in the U.S., but also for the lifting of all sanctions. And now uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, solving of this crazy situation that the U.S. have created around Citgo, which is a company that values, is valued in, in around $11 billion and that had a revenue before all this craziness of $1 billion every year. So you can imagine uh, how important that company is for a country like Venezuela and for any anyone. So that's basically uh, our position on the International Conference on Venezuela organized by President Petro. We still have expectations about that initiative uh, moving forward and, you know, reaching, uh, bringing so, some results. And, and talking about why, what, what I call Guaido's final act, uh, basically, uh, I just wanted to mention that is uh, this plead of Guaido to Colombia and then him almost being expelled or deported by the Colombian government and 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 taken by the U.S. agents uh, to the airport and buying his ticket to the U.S. is one of those tragic comic um I don't know how to say it um situations created by the tragic comic uh Guaido pro uh, regime change project. So uh I mean but let me start from the beginning from I mean it's important to say that Guaido was one of those pre-candidates that were part of the opposition and that, that were running for the opposition primaries. So the the first read when when I hear that the guy was in, in Colombia <clears throat> was wow, that guy knew that no one was going to vote for him uh, and took the decision of, you know, taking advantage of the conference organized by Petro and he jumped to Bogota in order to become uh, an, an auto exilee. Uh, so, so that was uh, my first read about the decision of Guaido uh, fleeing Venezuela. Of course, <laughs> then it comes with all the lies. Uh, this guy is a mitomano, we say in Spanish. I believe that that word exists in English also. The guy is a uh, my, mitomaniac or something like that. Uh, a big liar, in other words. And, uh, and 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 the first day when he arrived to Bogota, he said that he was going to participate in the conference. Uh, and it, that was immediately uh, mm, rejected by by the Colombian government that says that uh, Guaido was not invited and was not part of any of the delegations invited to Bogota. So that was the first lie. Then, he uh he was almost deported by by the by the Colombian authorities because because he entered uh according to Colombian authorities entered Colombia illegally without passing uh migration controls so that moved the the Colombian government in order to try to get him and take him and 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 find a solution and the solution was provided by the u s government according to the words of um Colombian Chancellor uh Alvaro Leiva. He basically gave all the details in a press conference <clears throat> last week uh where he explained basically that 
when they uh, find out that Guaido was in Colombia, after Guaido himself um, published it on his Twitter account, uh, they initiated a search using Migración Colombia, the Colombian Migration Office, uh, in order to try to, to solve the problem because they checked that he, the guy did not enter legally through any checkpoints uh, through the border. Uh, so they start searching around and they receive a call from a high official from the U.S. government. That's, those were the words uh, used by Leiva. Uh, uh, telling them about the whereabouts of Guaido in Bogota. They, they reach, with that information, the, the Colombian government reached Guaido and basically uh, uh, ask him to find a, a way to, 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 to get out of that ish uh, migration uh, problem that he created. And at that point, the U.S. government uh, took him, bought him uh, an, air, an air ticket. And with two agents, we don't understand if they were, you know, police agents, CIA agents or diplomatic agents. Anyway, U.S. agents took him to El Dorado Airport, where he took an Avianca flight to Miami. And then he was receiving Miami. Since the beginning, um, Guaido was saying that he were, he escaped because he was worried about the safety of his family. That's one of the things that that also surprised me. I mean, if someone is threatening my family, the first things that I do is to protect my family, not protect myself. So, so that was was one of the first things that did not click right. And uh, and and keep, he he kept saying the same scene after he landed in Miami, and he said, uh, "My uh, my wife received threats, and my the my my wife relatives received threats, and that's why I decided to flee Venezuela." And, and you say, "Wow, that's part of the mythomania of this guy that uh, jumps from one light to the other with the." Uh, audacity of I don't know, uh, but anyway, that's what the guy said, and and, and of course that created a lot of uh, distrust. So not even not even only uh, among chavistas, but also among right wingers that said, I mean, come on, guy, I mean, how are you gonna be uh, threatened, and, and you are gonna, I mean, how your family is gonna be threatened, and you are the one that is gonna uh, leave the country and leave your family that is the one being threatened in Venezuela. So, I mean, that's one of those crazy things that Guaido has accustomed us for years. Another thing that he said after he arrived was that he came with his backpack like many migrants and he suffered a lot. And then the other day, yesterday or before yesterday, we saw him with a very nice suit. Uh, in the uh, in Washington, and then next to Luis Almagro, trying to revive him somehow. Uh, uh, Almagro, the the head of the OIS. So um, that's basically what happened with Guaido. I believe that this is the final chapter in this Guaido. Of course, in this Guaido, terrible, tragic, comic. Um, um, I don't know how to say the theater of the absurd that we live uh, in recent years in Venezuela. But of course, they're going to try to uh, keep him alive somehow for a few weeks. But uh, I believe that this is it for Guaido. So that's basically it, my friend. Sorry if I took too long. I again invite you uh, to support us, uh, invite you to uh, volunteer us, subscribe, uh, clicking in those you know uh, boxes that you see. Uh, everywhere in the video and we're going to have a, a four and a half uh, anniversary this month at the end of, the mo of this month and we want you to know that we're going to try to organize a few activities um, um, in relation to that event and of course we want to uh, initiate a fundraising campaign to try to see if uh, we can solve a lot of financial difficulties that we are facing here in Caracas lately. 
Un abrazo, compas, and thank you for listening.